Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Alejandro for accepting our invitation to present this webinar. Alejandro is an architect and he is working as computational designer at KCAP, developing internal tools and integrating real time environmental simulations in their workflow. He recently joined TUDEL's faculty as a guest teacher in urban and computational design. Today, he will show us how new technologies and logics are used in KCAP using Rhino and Grasshopper across, across the different project phases and disciplines in the office. In particular, the work they are currently developing in visualizing different European regulations. He will also show how they integrate different open source plugins to design with building codes. Their work is key to match with the office's sustainability and carbon neutral ambitions. I would like to remind you that you can use the chat to ask questions and we will answer them after Alejandro's presentations. Also that the webinar is being recorded and tomorrow we'll upload it to YouTube. Again, thank you very much to everyone and please Alejandro start when you're ready. Thank you Guillermo and thank you everyone that is joining us. I hope that you're hearing me fine. Yeah. Um, also, um, I will try to keep it as short as possible, so maybe we have a bit more time for the Q&A in case you need to ask anything or you want to complain or, you know, you want to say like, oh, you guys not, are not doing anything interesting at all. Uh, because I'm quite convinced that we are more or less doing what everyone else is doing and maybe we're just framing it differently or even framing it at the same, at the same time. So I prepared the presentation. I have a couple of, you know, grasshopper scripts open um, in the background. Actually, I was telling Guillermo before that I found out that I, we had the webinar today because I'm a mess with the calendars. And today was the first time that I actually watched the other, you know, webinars that were prepared by architects. And then I realized that people were presenting actual grasshopper scripts and I just had a presentation. So, you know, everything is a bit of improvised. So feel free also, you know, to, you know, attack me in the same way. Um, so I want to introduce you, first of all, the team I'm working with. I'm not alone in KCAP. We are quite a large team developing, um, let's say, computational design or computational design tools. Also, who we are, what's our approach, some projects where we integrated our tools, more specifically about the tools. And maybe I show you a couple of, you know, like uh, live samples of what we are um, so KCP is a multinational company. We have quarters in Europe and, and Asia. We started, let's say, as the housing division of OMA around 30, 35 years ago, and then eventually specialized more into urban design, or let's say starting integrating urban design, both in what a urban designer and an architect practices, but also in the conception of municipalities. Um, we are very much in depth into try to bridge in, let's say, environmental topics or sustainable topics within our urban transformations and architecture, but mainly we are a community. We are a community of people. Uh, here we see my colleagues from the Zurich office having lunch the only day that they had sun last summer. Um, and this is actually our team. We are a team of eight members. Um, but working mainly on computational design, the ones that you see in the back. Uh, so me, myself, Cosmin, Ale Alberto, and I want to also point out Anastasia that is no longer with us, but she kind of supports us from time to time. Um, so for KCP, computational design is this department or this cluster that within the office tries to bridge disciplines, teams, offices, faces, and stems. We're kind of in the middle of everything. We're the most gossipy department in the office, and we try to have foot in as many projects as possible. Um, this also means that we take a look very much into trying to use our computational design skills, not just to develop digital tools or digital projects, but also look at workflows, even to use, you know, like at electricity usage in the office to try to make, make ourselves more sustainable. Our focus, if we take a look at this Andrew Human um, diagram, is more in the medium and small uh, size tools. We're more into integrating computational thinking into a designer's minds rather than building very complicated and very large like skill sets or let's say pieces of puzzles that just us as computational designers can use. But this is not something new. This is not something that started neither with me or with the people that briefly came before me, but actually KCAP has been, let's say, implicated in the world of computational design for many years. 
uh, through the chair of computational aided and augmented design of ETH Zurich. They founded together a collaboration called Kaisersrot, which is kind of this weird name that you see here. And they were trying to implement coding into the design of you know everyday offices this is a collaboration they did with herzog and the Merum for for the prime tower in zurich and eventually this kind of computational thinking led into urban thinking like the grand urban rules book from alex lenera in which basically they were trying to look at the city from the point of view of computers in the sense of if we're able to conceptualize the city we are able to algorithmic uh, the city always with the mindset of we want to host urban wilderness. There were some key projects that were actually built in the end, for example, the Weinhaven Mainland, which is an island in Rotterdam. It's one of the first experiments that they did with cigarette towers, and it's com the machine is computer generated, or the office area of Europaale, which is the main station area next to the Zurich uh, Hauptbahnhof, which was mainly uh, trying to develop computational generated envelopes to host the different machines, trying to look at the role of computer in the designer as an abstract way. Let's say this kind of enlarged framework, trying to limit, but also to give freedom to the designer. And these kind of envelopes, which I'm sure that if you're familiar with, you know, urbanism or architectural thinking, um, they are kind of useful, like most of our competitors or most of our colleagues are, um, outside KCAP, they're using them. But actually, we just based it in the New York regulations, which date like from the 19th century. So, you know, this is the massing. But in the end, it's everything about we don't want to focus or our scope of computational design doesn't go to form making, but rather to form thinking. How do you form or how do you frame your thoughts to then lead into the design that you want to do? Um, I really invite you to look into the website of Kaisersrott. It's much more interesting than anything that I have ever done, and I'm still trying to figure out how they could do these things 20 years ago. So I really invite you there. Um, I'm going to present you now some projects that, let's say, we have integrated computational design um, into the workflow. One is a project in Bratislava in which we were trying to predict people's flows. Um, another one, if this video goes a bit faster, is a competition we did in Stockholm that we lost, sadly, in which we were trying to automate the generation of the massing, again, with this idea of you know, speculation and exploration. And also a project in Eindhoven in which we were trying to automate the generation also of this massing, but more based into some um, regulations. So in the first project, we were brought in by the team trying to you know, answer this question of, can we make this design future-proof? Like they had really bad experiences with public spaces in Slovakia and in Bratislava in in more in particular. So they, they tried to, they tried to use us to answer this conceptual question to us. So then we basically looked at agent-based simulations that were out, out there. We found an open source script and we implemented it through uh, C-sharp components in Grasshopper, trying to simulate more or less these kind of ideas of the cones of vision, desire paths, um, meet, uh, meet interests, and these kind of things. And here is a simulation of what happens at the entrance of my office every day in the morning. You can see that I'm always the last one to arrive. And while everyone in the office is kind of already going to their places, I'm kind of getting lost in between talking to people and you know going to the toilet finding coffee and these things and then this was applied to the actual site and we found that it was very difficult to kind of grasp this kind of thing so we even we got it really wrong trying to apply it into into another project but refining and refining and refining it's something that has kind of become a standard tool that we use every time we have to approach an open space project before the designers launch their design, we kind of try to give them an exploration or kind of give them guidelines of, or where people would like to walk. Sometimes it's not possible, sometimes it's possible. And then we reuse the same script to actually evaluate how their design is performing. So our question was, can we predict people's wishes more or less? Uh, but is this better than what we had before? For sure. Um, then the project that I was telling you about in Stockholm, uh, basically the guidelines of the of the competition were about 
not modifying the horizon of the city. It doesn't matter if they fucked it up in the past or not, if they built ugly buildings or not in the past, we just need to preserve it the way that it was. So we were looking at the different, at the different horizon lines from different viewpoints that were kind of important for the UNESCO um, grading. And then we were developing this kind of automatic abstract massing kind of with this pixelated language that was trying to, you know, trying to generate or to influence the design in the same of or in the idea of can we actually start predicting where the designers will try to to grasp things and we were really happy with this project because we were able to bring this kind of knowledge from the virtual world growth into what the designer eventually did and the last project that i wanted to show you is something that is kind of confidential still but the methodology is going to be soon published into a paper and it's something that we call the pixel program or the boolean program um, if you're familiar with boolean logics booleans are basically true or false information and we were trying to invert the process on how computational design is usually approached to to design processes in the sense of normally you would try to generate um or kind of use a generative approach and from our side it was like okay let's take the massing let's take the input as something that is kind of god spell that we cannot touch and let's just try to assess it and to say okay given this massing and given how we define certain elements within the massing let's see if we can fit whatever the developer or the designer wants to fit in into this massing and we sorted out this kind of very long list of questions which is even longer trying to force designers and clients to define you know what is a house from the point of view of the outcomes of the of the analysis does a house need a certain level of daylight does a house need direct sunlight does a house need to be you know underheated overheated heated by the sun uh, can it be exposed to certain winds can it be exposed to certain noise pressures and these kind of things and using kind of this computational thinking of we're going to analyze with open source tools mainly ladybug or procedural for wind or even taking the maps from the municipality bridging gis uh, to geometry using grasshopper creating this kind of nose clouds we took the massing divided into little pixels and we started to dump information into each one of these pixels so that eventually we could compare let's say all this boolean information that we had in each one of the pixels with the profiles that we built so if the pixel was private but didn't have a good view but was let's say radiated enough but was not exposed to noise but was not exposed to wind and this matched you know what we assume that is a house then that cube could be actually highlighted as a house if not it could not be highlighted so it was a way of you know assessing the massings and seeing that maybe you know this very traditional um vertical division of program that we usually uh do in 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 urbanism was not that direct if you saw it from the point of view of the results of the analysis in the end i wanted to show you what we did in a project in eindhoven in which we were brought in in a very traditional way in the sense that um usually computational design in tcp is mainly to bring environmental information to the designer so we just took the environmental let's say law concerning sunlight in the netherlands and we just used different ladybugs and different i think it was three slot and tt toolbox components to reframe the information in the way that the law was requiring us to do and we generated this map but it was a bit sad in the sense of we are just evaluating we are not really doing anything we're not doing rocket science here so we thought why don't we you know we don't care about the results we are just we are just here to kind of grade the projects and get if they are good enough or not why don't we just we don't care about this we're just going to start analyzing random or more abstract geometry and let's see if we are able to get to the same results as our designers did let's see if the computer can actually build beat the designer and then using this logic of the stochastic processes of 
we just care about the process. We just care about that our Grasshopper script is kind of clean and it's doing what it's needing to do and we are not biasing our, our own design. So then we trust the outcome that we're going to get. So what you see on, on the left side is kind of this analysis that we produce automatically. And what you see on the right side is this kind of abstract envelope, taking again this concept of you know the levels of freedoms to the to the designer to see using EMOs and using different, you know, different solutions to see if we could iterate and improve this kind of abstract mass and trying to arrive to these towers that you see actually uh, here. So we generated options, we generated also methodologies on how you could take this abstract massing and then from that build something that was actually buildable that you know a client would understand because if you send this mountain to a client then they're gonna you know send you to to an employment. And we were generating and generating and generating. And up to a point, it was we were just generating an uncertainty. We were generating so many options and we didn't have a way to compare it. So whenever we do emails, I always think about this exhibition that was done in Madrid by Sana, in which they brought like a thousand five hundred models of this Kifu museum. And then it was like, okay, honestly, can you tell me what is the difference between this? different scenarios because I don't really see it. Maybe you're moving just one centimeter or maybe you're just completely changing the plot, but I'm overwhelmed by the outcome. And this is something that we cannot allow to happen. So thanks to that, we started to implement in our workflow, the Design Explorer that was designed, that was um, developed by Thornton Tomasetti and the Penn University, which has really helped us to communicate, you know, to communicate and to document every outcome of every production that we are doing. So what you see on the left side is a parametric study that we are doing for a project somewhere in the Netherlands. And on the right side is, you know, this dashboard where we then feed all this information. So in the end, we are mainly, we are mainly looking at sun, we are looking at wind, we're looking at noise, we're looking at, you know, generation of facades, but in the end, what we're looking at is generation and information we are just interested in you know framing information in a comprehensible way that can actually help the designer to make their design better that's the only thing that we are aiming at so these are the main tools that we have developed through uh throughout 2022 so we have we have implemented win technologies using procedural we are collaborating with certain institutions trying to assess noise in the best possible way we were looking at the flows, we were looking at deadline and also at web products in the sense of how easy it is to just open a web browser and see your results compared to, um, let's say, getting a designer to have the fear of this spaghetti monster, which is something that I'm sure that most of you have ever felt. Also, I think it's important to say that uh, we we mainly use open source tools. We, we also develop things on our own, but we are mainly looking at not trying to replicate, you know, what consultants do in the end, consultants or experts are always there, but we're just trying to get that information a bit earlier in the process. Maybe not to predict the final outcome, but at least to know that if I'm choosing option A over option B, it's because I know for sure that it's gonna be better in the end. So it's not about accuracy, which of course is important, but it's mostly about whether I'm comparing A to B, that I know that A is better in certain aspects and B is better in other aspects. And in the end, most of the things that we do in computational design, mostly applicable to sustainability and to environmental design is about, you know, how do you quantify quality? How a certain level of sun ponderated with a certain level of daylight is something that is good or that is not good enough. So for that, we have invested a lot of time in developing this kind of legends or this kind of dashboards that sometimes we develop with uh, a connection to Power BI or that sometimes we use human UI or human as it is, or even conduit from, from proving ground. Because these things are key for us to understand what the hell is going on on the screen on 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 Rhino. Um, I'm bringing this video in. Uh, I participated in the development of this um, uh, video game, which was actually a, 
a, a European proposal that was won but never realized with an office in Madrid. And what I what I found the most interest about this project is not you know like this kind of nice visuals and drawings, but actually what it's happening here. This idea that you know every time you put something on the table, every time that you bring in new information to the context of what you're operating with, you're altering the metrics and you're altering the dashboards. And the dashboards are giving you a different metrics. And this is what we are actually trying to do in KCAP. We want to develop things that are fast enough so that designers can design with them and that they can learn themselves how to model better, maybe through the outcome of a sun study, through the outcome of a daylight study, et cetera. And for that, and that's where we are investing most of our time. Here are some images on you know, important projects that we have had so far. So such as CFD analysis, such as acoustics that we're developing in collaboration with AMS and Bauhaus University. Daylight tools that are also being developed in collaboration with TNO. Uh, but also most importantly for us, it's very important to use this kind of open source plugin such as Human UI to, let's say, bridge the gap between um, us experts in Grasshopper or that we are not afraid of Grasshopper. I would not consider myself an expert to the designers that actually should be the ones that are using this kind of tool. So what you see here is kind of a typical workflow that we have implemented in the in the office. This is also a very exciting tool that I'm very happy to share. Um, this was developed by um, one of our designers, but somehow it's not really working. I will show you live later. Or, you know, the integration with tools such as Power BI. I would like, I would really like to thank this one because this is a link between one click LCA and a model in Rhino. This was developed by Diego Apellanis, and this is a fantastic plugin and a fantastic you know workflow of bringing your 3d into something that is linked to dashboards and to different um metrics so i i would really welcome you guys to explore these tools and to explore one one click lca and every publication that diego has has done um in the end uh what we're trying to do you know it's getting this kind of uh, geometrical outputs or trying to link them into into computational operations or into computational um, analysis. So, for example, we have one of our key projects on the right side is called the Red Apple. It's quite a large skyscraper in this computer generated neighborhood that I was uh, showing you at the beginning with one of our privacy tools or view quality tools and how the facade is kind of reacting to, to this kind of um, massing implications. This is always something that we are that we are trying to do. Um, we are heavily committed with openness and with open data and with open design. Actually, my office curated the Rotterdam Biennale in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, with the idea of open city. So we are open in our design and we're opening to data and soon we will release a github in which you guys can look at the ways we you know reframe what is getting out of the ladybug or reframe what is getting out of the honeybee because in the end we are all using open source tools and it doesn't make sense that we keep this kind of knowledge uh, to ourselves we will also publish let's say a more pdf version of everything that we're doing and yeah, the GitHub, which is something that is there. Um, so for us in the end, everything we do, everything that we do at my department, but also in any other department in KCAP is about trying to reach your vanity. And defining your vanity is something that is very complicated. My office has been busy with this for 35 years, um, but it's something that we are trying now from computational design. And of course, we would really welcome any help that you know any one of you has on helping us bridge in that gap. So for, for us, computational design is something that is key towards what we consider a conscious, conscious age of design. I think there is a typo um, there, which is not about you know generated design or or replicating or surpassing the designer but mostly about um, how we can bring more information on the table so that anything that we do 
is at least conscious. We can take, any, like the designer can take any freely decision that they want to take. But for us, what is mostly important is that um, whatever decision that is taking is taking with the facts on the table. And that's why we invest so much in dashboards. And that's why we invest so much into this kind of data outputs or communicating our tools. Also, uh, we really welcome applications, work with us. We are really happy to have new people on the team, both in the urban architecture, landscape, or even computational design. And also, we are quite humanistic in the team. Most of the things that we develop have a conceptual um, background or a conceptual back. And so if you are free to get any of these references, these are the books that we always recommend in the office for people that want to, you know, kickstart on the, on the computational um, thing. And I think that was it for the presentation. Thank you very much for, for your attention. I think I went quite fast. So we have a still have an hour. Um, so I, I just wanna, you know, like I showed you all these things, you know, these very fast videos, which were a bit difficult to grasp. So I just have a couple of scripts open here that are maybe interested, uh, interesting for you. Um, that, I mean, I've been looking at, you know, what my colleagues have been doing in past webinars, and I think we're not as advanced as they are, but we are trying to do our, our little things. So what I have here on, on the screen is something that, you know, it's, I think it's a really good representation of what we call a low hanging fruit, which is these kind of tools that save a hell of a lot of time to designers that are kind of easy to, to, to develop and that kind of, you know, bring happiness to everyone, which is something that is quite important to all of us. So as you see here, as you see here, we have a massing which is quite simple, you know, a plinth and some layers on on top. And what we have on, on the grasshopper is just something that can actually be minimized once, you know, we press here on play um, and we press here on play. This is what we call an area calculator. Oh, sorry. Um, you know what conduit that from time to time you need to refresh it. So basically what this script is doing is um, we're getting some information in a dashboard here that is fixed on, on the screen. Um, this dashboard is reading um, whatever is happening inside this layer. So we have project one copy, project one copy. We have a plinth and we have the square meters. Um, I think that we can turn this on and off if I'm not mistaken. So we're looking at these three buildings there. Um, so basically, this is a script that is reading whatever layer you have selected and it's just giving you the information. Maybe you want to know in particular what's happening here. So if you select your building, we automatically read whatever is happening there and we try with the same colors to give the information to designers. And this was something that was a bit complicated to develop because we needed to build something that was fast enough so that we would not you know, speed down the, um, the workflow with the designers, but at the same time, we wanted to bring information to the table so that they would not have to have, you know, Excel open on a, on a second screen. So this is a plugin that we're plugging, sorry, a script that we're really proud of. And then also, you know, like we, we also try to use generative design as much as possible. So this is an example of a current project we're working on in which we are, you know, linking different massing methodologies such as I think this is the, the good one. So for example, different footprints with some sun studies in which we can, you know, simply simply change the way that we generate the massing or or the way that we that we generate options. So this is kind of what we have been busy in the office. As you see, we're not really using anything particularly different than anyone is using, but we are trying to you know, bridge all the data together so that it's kind of easy to, for non-experts and for our designers, not to be afraid of it, but mostly, you know, to to integrate it into their day-to-day -day workflow and to understand, you know, what the computer is um, doing in the background. So um, I see quite some questions. I went, I went quite fast. Guillermo, I can show more stuff, but if, if you want, we can maybe start with the questions. Thank you. Um, I do prefer. 
Yeah. Uh, if yeah, you yeah. prefer to answer some questions and then you can continue if we have time. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I actually, this is what I wanted mm. to show you guys. Maybe I can mm. stop a bit further into, into any other things, but, you know, I okay. will okay. a bit of the restaurant menu here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have uh, two questions. So um, the first one is, is from Omar. He says, thanks and great talk. And if you can quickly clarify the Boolean part again. If it's yeah, a yes sorry. or no, yeah, well, he explains yeah, yeah. a little bit the, the um, questions. Uh, he says, if it's a yes or no answer to the questions, to the question, does the building need a good view? For example, I ask myself, why go with Boolean rather than a priority point system, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so um, thanks, Omar, for your question. And thanks for, for your attention, like, you know, your, your attention. Um, so we decided to go for a Boolean because in the end, so for us, computational design or mostly grasshopper is a language and, you know, language frame thoughts in different ways. And we, we are really believers that the way we talk is the way we think. So, uh, for us, it was really important that the way we would frame the question in this specific case was to non-experts, um, was clear enough. Um, we thought about the point system, but the point system, when you need to ask 25 questions, would get really complicated. So this was this was more trying. It was I would say that maybe it's not that much of a computational experiment rather than a sociological one in the sense of if you force someone to answer yes or no questions to qualitative assess, you know, what a house is or where an office is, by default, they're going to say yes to everything. They're going to say yes to everything that is beneficial for them because that's what, you know, we want the best. We want the iPhone with the biggest specs. But then you realize that maybe the iPhone with the biggest specs is not the one that you can afford. And in this case, it was kind of similar, like in the sense of if you started to say yes to everything and you started to try to reach for the highest quality within the massing, and within the results that you were having. Of course, if you're building high rise, you're gonna have heavy winds somewhere. Maybe it's just, you know, on the top first, but that would already discard that area as a possibility for a house. So this was this was a really interesting communication tool in the sense of the client and the designers could live see the kind of housings that they were creating from, you know, from the beginning on. They were able to see, oh, the design that I'm that I'm doing, this kind of attractive massing that I'm proposing here, is actually returning no end results. So what I'm doing is actually not enabling what I consider to be the minimum qualities of a house. Or maybe it's the other way. I'm thinking of a house, or I'm thinking that an office has a lot of requirements, but maybe an office doesn't need a good view. Of course, how or what you consider a good view to to be is is maybe a matter of discussion. I don't know if I clarified a bit what was happening here, but maybe like in 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 the specific context of view, what we do is we use isovist and we use the coding spaces to check how much area we are able to perceive that is non-blocked from in, from every window, and the highest area, the highest non-blocked area is supposed to be a better view. So that's how we assess view quality. But maybe you have a different understanding or a different interpretation. Thank you. Yes, I think it's clear. If not, uh, Omar can ask again or ask further. And the second question we have from Stu, I will say, mm -hmm. is uh, does your workflow link with BIM processes? Um, we are we are looking we are looking into it. Uh, I have to say that traditionally in my office, beam processes have been um, kind of split. It. So computational design and beam has never been related. That's something that is starting slowly uh, to change because beam so far was something that happened in technical phases. So once the design is over, let's say that you know it kind of goes to the back of the office and then you never see it again. Um, but this is this is something fundamental. We're working more and more, particularly in Revit. 
when we are developing workflows, for example, using Speckle to send information, for example, taking the rooms in in Revit to do daylight analysis in in Grasshopper or using Rhino inside Revit to assign different parameters. Um, this this kind of things. I don't know if I have answered your your question. I think so. So yes, you are trying to to continue the the workflow, right? To yeah, from, yeah. from sketch from analysis to to BIM. Yeah, yeah. Up to up to a point, you know. Like I think this is. Um, I mean, I'm sure that there are a lot of people that are much more experienced than I am mm -hmm. with these matters. But um, one of the main focus that, or one of the main problems that any big office or even small office has is um, how do you take information, how do you pack information, and that, how do you send it somewhere else that it's kind of well read. So in the case of in the case of BIM, you can do BIM with 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 Rhino and we use Visual ARQ, for example, quite often, um, mostly for urban design and for landscape design. Um, but at the same time, you need to communicate with other softwares, you need to communicate with other parties. I have to say that Rhino is quite good from my experience in order you know, to assign information to geometry and that it's easily read somewhere else. But it's not about, you know, you, and your information is about that your work is easily read by other people. That's what is most important, at least for us. Thank you. Yeah, I will share the the link. I have shared the links to the plugins that you commended. I think I I probably miss some of them. I shared <laughs> Human UI, one click LCA, and Visual Arc. Yeah, but, uh, I would yeah, I would add Speckle to to that list. NTT toolbox for us is fundamental and Elephant for catching, you know, like for working with data processes or, or okay. these kind of things. Yeah, Actually, we'll try to send all of them, but yeah. No, it's okay. I mean, maybe, maybe I can send you. This was something quite cool that was uploaded to LinkedIn uh, by Timo Harbour. Mm -hmm. I think he's the lead computational designer of Rumble. And he developed this little guide that if you click on it, it's going to give you the plugins that you're using on a script. So actually you can see it here. So yeah. what, what I was showing you guys on the on the script of the area calculators, you know, we use Conduit a lot. We love graphics and we love dashboards and this kind of things. Elephant is fundamental. Telepathy, if you have never used it, is really, really good. It's for connecting wires from one side to another. Yeah. Pufferfish. Sasquatch is really good. It brings a lot of, you know, Rhino functionalities into into Grasshopper. Um, but yeah, I hope I'm not forgetting any of them. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I see oh, also that you have MetaHopper installed. Yeah, of course. All of them. <laughs> All of them. All it's of good them. To, to test them and yeah, it's easy to, to download and they are most of them free, I think, the ones you have, yeah. Yeah, we use. I mean, we we use paid ones, and as as much mm -hmm. as we can, we support developers yeah. because we really appreciate anything anything you do. When we were at the beginning doing, um, sorry that I'm jumping all over, but I'm I'm getting a bit nervous because I went too fast. But uh, when we were starting to develop this kind of analysis, you know, this this kind of um, desire paths, we looked at different engines, and and I think we were trying to use something called Petsim which worked really good, but for the urban scale was a bit difficult. But anyway, for example, we tried to support the developer and we paid for any any yeah. time that any computer got this plugin installed, we paid for it. I mean, it was like no money, so it was, it was okay. Great. Continuing with the questions, if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip is asking, I think, because of the previous image that you were showing, uh, how do you evaluate noise, for example? Noise. Um, so let me get to the noise slide. So noise is, is kind of tricky. Uh, so in in the slide with the GIFs, uh, what we did was uh, we took the shape files from the municipality of Amsterdam, uh, because this project was in Amsterdam, and, and we looked at the metadata and basically the, we had enough contour layers to position it into the, you know, like to take a 2D shape file and to position it into 
into the space and then to to kind of interpolate and generate reps from them and for let's say more in-depth uh studies uh, we like we basically took the exnosos regulation which is a european directive that is slowly going to get translated into into national uh, eu member states eu member states regulations and we looked at the methodology and the methodology is explained there, like how you need to simplify a car, how that car is throwing rays, how many reflections you're measuring. For that, uh, we we looked at pachyderm on on you know as a plugin to to create the rays and to create the the vectors. But most of it is pure grasshopper. We are not really. I mean, whenever whenever we see a good package to automate, we maybe do a C sharp component, but nothing. We are basically looking at very, very boring logarithmic equations, and we are just you know, transforming them into colors. We are not doing something extraordinary here. I mean, what, what is extraordinary are our partners in AMS and in Bauhaus. They are the true experts in this, and they are the ones that know when we fucked up the, an analysis, they know where to look at, which is something that we are not trained for to do. But I mean, I would really welcome if, you know, a good, skilled developer is willing to you know develop the ladybug for noise that would be great for us yeah that would be great um Any more questions yes we uh, have a lot of them oh, nice uh what is this asking um no sorry this is well was for me that the recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow yes in youtube um if you have, uh, Derek is asking if you have uh, any specific experience case study that you can share on using Elephant in your European design workflow. Uh, I don't know if um, now. Thinking, um, well, I don't have it prepared, but we, we have a workflow that we have used quite often um, to basically take urban massings and then exporting ifcs with visual arq mm -hmm. and you know like ifc is not dumb geometry ifc is you know geometry with metadata so for us it's very so we use elephant and elephant attributes for the you know for the designer to specify certain certain keys and certain values to the geometry so that then we can, you know, make logics based on on those. So mainly, mainly Elephant is kind of this communication engine between, you know, all the information operations that we do on Grasshopper and, you know, the input information that we get from the designer. I don't, I don't know if that was very abstract. I hope not. Yeah, no, no, perfect. Um, okay, and Kang is asking, how do you, do you differentiate your internal flow tools from, for example, a space syntax? How does it differ? Um, it doesn't, I guess. Um, I mean, we we use if if you if you're looking at the space syntax as the theory, or if you're looking at the coding spaces as the plugin, we use the coding spaces quite often. It more it's more about you know like. Um, I would take the analogy from some studies. Like you, you use Ladybug as we all use Ladybug. Ladybug is a great plugin. Thank you so much for MIT for developing it. Um, so you know, like you do a sun analysis, and then it tells you per prop point you are getting these hours of sun. But what we do is that we take that result, maybe we compare it with an existing situation, maybe we do some calculations. Or we try to estimate, you know, from analyzing ten days what's happening through the year. So in the end, it's not as it's not taking, you know, like the component as it is, but it's understanding the information that is given us and maybe combine it with different operations. So in the case of the coding spaces, for example, we are. It's a bit difficult for the designers to understand, you know, this concept of closeness centrality or between the centrality, but we have a scripts that kind of try to use them and try to develop them and try to measure. So for example, in the specific case of decoding spaces or space syntax, um, we try to assess what 
is the desired outcome of the plugin. So, you know, you get a network and you get the stress of the network and how the network is performing from the VC wise. Uh, and then we compare it. So that's, that's for example, how we use it, but it doesn't really differ from, from those theories. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Next is from Joe that is asking if you use uh, Python, uh, Python in the design workflow. Mm -hmm. You say yes, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We we like. I mean, we we don't use it. I would love to know more Python. Mm -hmm. but I think we would all love to know more Python in general in life. No, but we try we try to pack as much components as possible. But we use it inside Grasshopper. What I mean is that we use it either for things that are not existing, or for trying to make things more efficient. So the more things you dump into a Python component, the more efficient your workflow is gonna be. Like in the end, as something that I told you guys before, like for us, it's not about, you know, building very complex scripts that we are just able to use. For us, it's more about doing things that are easy to use and that are very fast so that, you know, a designer, one, knows how to use them. Second, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, over caffeinating themselves because every time they run an analysis, they need to go to the coffee machine. So that's kind of so we use Python mainly mainly for generating things that don't exist and for to you know clustering um, operations. Great, thank you. And Diederik is saying, uh, "Well, thank you for the lecture." And he's asking um, the Pixel program tool, the Boolean tool that Omar was referring before seems to have a lot of optimizable outputs. Did you guys work on a tool that will optimize them all at the same time, or are you following a certain order based on priority of the output? Mm, yeah. No, it, there, is, there, is no pri there is no priority in the workflow. Um, this, will, this will be extensively documented on a paper, but um, it's not. So imagine you get a machine you split the massing in little Lego pieces. Mm. And then each one of that Lego piece goes through 27 different scripts. And then you basically check what's happening with that Lego piece in the sun, what's happening with that Lego piece in the wind, what's happening with that Lego piece in the in the um, in the noise, in the privacy, even in some decoding spaces related um, topics. And then you bring back that information into a, let's say, an output grasshopper script that is basically reading all those booleans and is generating parallel list. So that's kind. Of, so it's like in the end, in the end, what you're doing is you're getting your zeros and ones from from different scripts, but you are not optimizing; you are analyzing. Okay, because um, he says, yeah, that that if uh, you are using the design explorer. In its segment to filter as it will generate a lot of output outcomes. Mm -hmm. But we use Design Explorer to document, for example, um, generative processes. So the pixel program is not a generative process, it's an analysis tool. It's assessment, not generation. Okay, thank you. And Himanshu is asking what's the right tool to evaluate for the human movement and how we can connect several simulations that we want to connect with, uh, I get lost. The first question is, what's the right tool to evaluate for the human movement? And I think you were showing PetSim, right? Mm, we we tried PetSim, it's quite easy to use. Uh, eventually we moved into a you know custom C-sharp component because for us, it, we were defining things in a different way. Um, but you know, like I don't, I don't have an answer for that. It depends on the parameters that you're considering or how you simplify reality. Yeah. So it's not I, I'm not I'm not really on to I guess I guess that eventually we will have, you know, like an AI predicted map using GPS data or something or something like that. I hope that someone is developing that. I, yeah, because the second question I'm not sure, but I think the it's is the same answer. Because mm -hmm. he asked um, how you can connect several simulations uh, to several human movements, I understand. Mm -hmm. But I think it's depending on, on the result that you expect to, to obtain. 
but I uh, yeah, I don't, yeah. I, if I if I understand, I mean, I I'm maybe understanding it in a different way in the sense of mm -hmm. how you connect different outcomes. Like for example, you can connect like. Um, I don't know if he's referring to the input wise or to the output wise. Like, I think it's quite easy to just analyze, you know, a dump of different methodologies and then combine them. That's kind of easy. And that's what we do, for example, with the pixel program or with other methodologies. I think that the problematic one would be how do you integrate, for example, radiation information with a pedestrian simulation? I think that's that's a bit more tricky in the sense of, how do you incorporate okay. environmental metrics into if people walk on the shadow or if the people walk on the sun? Because, for example, that's something that we don't take into account. But we mm -hmm. we we are not trying to go that far. We okay, leave that yeah. to let's say more more expertise. Yeah, that's uh, quite complex. But yeah, I like it about the um, the simulations that you were using them in several projects, and I think it's one of the most complex things about the. Um, using grasshopper definitions or well any uh, computational design any definition in a script is to to reuse it in different projects uh, mm. i don't know how how you do that yeah uh, we if you so have on, yeah if on, you have um, a smaller scripts that you can use by parts or if you mm -hmm. have a, a long definition and you can reuse most of it and then change a bit um Usually, usually we try to look at use cases. So if something kind of happens very often in very different mm -hmm. projects, we try to, you know, rework the script, stress it in different ways. And, you know, in the end, it's a bit like software developing. The more you try it, the more, out, like, the more, you know, proved that to use. So on the one hand, how, how to reuse it, you know, like by reusing it and improving it, there is no mystery there. The mystery or what, you know, I think it's it's a problem for any computational designer that works in an architectural or in a design or an engineering office is how you get other people to use it. Yeah. Because, you know, you, I'm not interested in keeping on using the things that I did. I'm already bored about them. I was presenting them to you guys and I was like, come on, this is so simple. What I, what I, why am I wasting these people's time? I want to just keep on digging and keep on doing other things. Um, but for that, you need, you need, that your colleagues and the people that sit next to you use them and incorporate them into the workflow. Um, sometimes it's because, you know, they think that it's something cool, which is, you know, it's like you you basically place, give them a toy and then they want to use it. Um, or because they have no other, you know, they have no other option because they need to take a look at certain environmental metrics. So, yeah, but it's not I, something sorry, maybe, that they maybe ask. It was a, maybe it was a bit of a sided answer, but like, it's not, it's not a question about, you know, how to make them replicable. It's about how to make them useful. Because if they are if they are not useful or they are not, you know, easy to use, they're never going to get used to them, even yeah. though they work. Yeah, but then it's not something they ask you. Um, so they don't tell to you, I need uh, to make a... I don't know, uh, sun analysis, sunlight analysis, you create that uh, tool and they and you try them to use it. Yep. Okay, that's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's more it's more important that people, you know, Grasshopper is, I mean, maybe I'm saying something wrong, but Grasshopper is very accessible. It's like yeah. this why why there are no, you know, like why there are no more people doing digital twins because it's fucking difficult to do. Why are we are so many computational designers? Because Grasshopper is very intuitive and it's it's very visual and it's very easy to use. So I, I don't I don't think that any of us is you know like a mastermind. We are not David Ruthen. We don't have you know like this kind of complex mind. We're just using something that is very really well done. Yeah, the, so the, the more definitions that you saw. Better, so. hmm? Sorry, the definitions that you saw are very well organized, and I think it's quite easy to open it in, if you don't know Grasshopper and you can use it anyway. We hope so. We invest a lot of time on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes time, but yeah, it's the only way to to make people that don't know Grasshopper or doesn't have a lot of experience with it to, to use them. Mm. I really like We don't have more questions. Oh, we have okay. one more, I think, from Jack. Hi, Jack. 
yeah it's about what we are talking about uh people get freak about and uh, freak out uh, by the wires um dynamo mm. player uh, help with that i don't know for example i think i think that dynamo dynamo is a really good example in the sense of i think that the interface like the node interface is let's say not as attractive as grasshoppers so it, it makes it more scary but you know like they paired it with dynamo player and i think grasshopper play is really is really good we never used it or we never looked into implementing it but for example human ui is great yeah so it's saying for example that in grasshopper we have hopes and uh, grasshopper player and just that yeah. are tools that make it easier that you don't have to open grasshopper and you can use the definition i mean for, for me that's that's kind of a bit of a mixed feeling i want people to i want people to know what is in the back that's kind of the good thing about grasshopper like it's not an iphone you can open yeah. it you can see what it's inside you can maybe try to understand it um but i think i think it's more about you know letting people doing it rather than forcing them to do it right that's a different that's a different question okay so jack is saying thank you um thank you. i don't know if you have anything one last thing to to show alejandro or no, I think I think for us that's all. I'm sorry that we are so simple that we just talked by 30 minutes. No, not at all. It was a lot of information very fast, I think. But yeah, really, you know, very interesting. You know, Guillermo knows that us Spaniards talk very fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, everybody's saying thanks a lot. Um, Thank you so much, guys. I, I tell you the same to you, Alejandro, and to everyone. So I repeat again that well, the webinar is recorded and I will upload it as soon as possible. Um, yeah, and, thank you. and if you guys have any questions or you want to, you know, follow up on the discussion, please write any of us on LinkedIn. We are yeah. very open to answer. I'm very happy to connect with more people. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bye, everyone. Thank you guys. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. See you.